Mays uh, did not believe that someone's environment was the greatest determinant of their outcome in life. And Mays said, it's not in your environment, it's you. The determination of your will, the integrity of your heart uh, that will shape your life and determine your future. And that's what Mays really believed. He believed that uh, you, you could be born poor, you could be born uh, to, to parents who were ex-slaves and were completely illiterate and still rise up to go on to earn a PhD and become an, an advisor to three presidents, uh, the longtime uh, president of Morehouse College, and literally shape and define a generation of Americans. Uh, simply by uh, doing the right things and not allowing your environment uh, to deter you. Welcome to the Gleams, Dr. Benjamin E. Mays Historical Preservation Site. Uh, we are a historic site here in Greenwood, South Carolina, uh, and our site is dedicated to preserving the memory and the life and legacy of Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays. Uh, we opened in 2011, and uh, since that time, uh, we have thousands of visitors that come through here a year to uh, experience the life and legacy of Dr. Mays. So on site here, uh, we have three structures. Uh, one is the birth home of Dr. Mays. Dr. Mays was born in that house of August 1st of 1894. Uh, he was born to two parents that were ex-slaves and uh, Dr. Mays rises out of those conditions to go on to be a uh, mentor to Dr. King, the uh, principal founder of the civil rights movement, uh, the longtime president of Morehouse College, and advisor to three presidents, and he really transformed the course of American society. We also have the Burn Spring School. It's not the actual school Dr. Mays attended. Dr. Mays attended a school called the Brick House School from age six until age 15. Uh, but we have the Burn Spring School. It was another one of the four schools that were built by his childhood pastor, Reverend James Foster Marshall. And so it gives you an idea of what Dr. Mays' early childhood uh, education was like. And we also here in the building we're in now have a, looks like an old barn, but it's a modern museum as you can see, that uh, we display Dr. Mays' life uh, in more than 100 pictures and, and, and uh, much memorabilia here that tells a story of Dr. Mays' life and legacy from birth to transition. And then also we keep what we call a living history here. Uh, outside we have a garden uh, where we keep a, a cotton field and, and uh, we grow corn and okra and tomatoes every year. Uh, Dr. Mays said in his autobiography that even when he was an old man that he uh, still loved to see the side of corn blowing in the wind. Uh, so we keep that out there. It is, a, it is a favorite of the children that come, particularly come in the fall uh, and be able to, to, to pick and, and play in the cotton field. But it gives people an idea of what Mays' early life was like because of course he enters the field picking and planting cotton full time at age five uh, and does that until uh, he's 20 years old when he finally leaves the farm and decides to not come back home any longer uh, to work as a sharecropper and decides to stay at high school down in South Carolina State High School Department. So inside the house, we've tried to um, decorate the house or make it look like it would have at the time of Dr. Mays' childhood there. Uh, and so you'll get a real sense of what Dr. Mays' life was like as a child. Uh, he was the youngest of eight children. There were five boys and three girls. And to imagine uh, ten adults living in that house and, and, and working in a field. And uh, we keep outside of the house a wash pan and there's a, uh, an outhouse. And so young people that come that, that have no idea what uh, life would have been like a hundred years ago uh, really get a sense of what Mays' childhood was like and so uh, we try to preserve that here for people to see. He was really an iconic man and so you get a sense of that uh, coming through the museum and just seeing uh, just the magnitude of his life. I often say that there's not really a period in African American history from the Reconstruction era uh, to the 1960s to the Civil Rights era that Mays' life does not touch in some way and additionally his life also touches the integration, the school integration period that goes on in the 1970s in the United States because at that time he is the, the president of the Atlanta Public Schools and he leads the Atlanta Public Schools through their desegregation process. So uh, you you really get a sense he coming here and when you see all that uh, just what kind of impact Mays had on American life and American society. Uh, I want people to get a sense of the dignity of Mays. Uh, Mays was a man that really made up his mind very early on that he was going to walk through life with dignity and pride and uh, he was going to make people respect him but uh, he was going to demand that respect by living his life a certain way uh, and conducting his business a certain way and then he goes on to demand that from his students and so I, I would like particularly younger people to get an idea of how serious Mays was about education. Uh, he thought it was really a, a defining uh, factor in many people's lives particularly the lives of those that were poor uh, and, and, and had less opportunities. He thought they should take education more seriously. And so I really want people to understand sort of the driving values that Mays had uh, that propelled him to become this iconic American. And uh, I think you get a sense of that if you come through here and see kind of the values that Mays lived his life by.